we're going to catch up on our backlog in the mailbag and answer viewer questions and comments. And that's it. That's all we're doing in this episode of Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, this week we took over a Niva Rock lighthouse to set up our studios so we could continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. Be one of the first three people to write into comments at genesisweek.com telling us where this lighthouse is, and you'll get a complimentary copy of Genesis and Aliens. Carried on the Miracle Channel in Canada, the Watt Television in the US, satellites all around the globe, and of course, the Chris Gineman Network on YouTube. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, that's the show, and you can find us. And while you're there, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Today's show is dedicated to responding to viewer mail, so let's get down to business. In response to our Roosterosaurus episode, Tim wrote in from Colorado. If birds are counted as dinosaurs because evolutionary theory supposes them to be descendants of dinosaurs, then logically all mammals are fish, as evolutionary theory supposes us to be descended from fish. I could see doing this for one or two generations, but across orders? Seriously? You have to draw the line somewhere. Why draw it where it's the most ridiculous? Excellent points. Thanks for writing in, Tim. Steve from Mississauga wrote in on Facebook in response to our Horus Manure segment, where we dismantled the idea that the stories of Jesus were just reworked legends of the Egyptian sun god Horus. Don't forget, Jesus had a bird land on his head. Horus has a bird for a head. Thanks for writing in, Steve. Now, Steve just made this up on the spot, satiring the Jesus is Horus myth. Now, in so doing, he made a very good point and brings me to another significant point. Now, the first point being, anybody can make this stuff up. <laughs> Secondly, it goes to show that with a bit of creativity and imagination, one can make a compelling sounding story that completely disguises and ignores the fascinating truth. For example, the incident that led to Jesus having a bird land on his head was his baptism. Now, baptism was not known before the time of Christ. This doesn't also just refute the ridiculous lie claimed by the Horus is Jesus advocates. It also brings up a very interesting relationship to Genesis. Why did Jesus get baptized? Why did the Holy Spirit descend on him in the form of a dove? Well, it's because the baptism was symbolic of the flood of Noah. Where do we read this particular story? Well, the book of Genesis. The flood of Noah was the first judgment on all of the world, and the symbolism between the flood of Noah and the ark and Jesus and the judgment to come is amazing. Now, there are only two people in the Bible that are listed as having an angel being sent to deliver the baby's name. Now, that was Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Zacharias, the husband of Elizabeth, Mary's cousin who would give birth to John the Baptist. Well, why the name John? When Elizabeth and Zacharias named their newborn son, their family questioned them for this, as no one in their family went by that name. Why was the angel Gabriel 
sent to tell Zacharias to name his son John. See, the name Noah is spelt in many different forms. New, Nun, Noah, Noe, No, Neo. Hebrew reads from right to left, the opposite of many languages like English and Greek. Now, when transliterated across languages, because of the different direction of read, the names would often get reversed. For example, Aeon, Own, Owan. From this root, you can see the name Noah in other names like Oenus, Johan, Johan, Jan, John, Ian. Or the feminine versions, Joanne, Joanna, Hannah, Iona, Joan, Jan, Jane, Janet, Janice, and Jean. They are all the same name. They all mean God's grace. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. John the Baptist, carrying out acts symbolizing Noah and the Great Flood, had the same angel-delivered name as Noah. As he was carrying out the symbolic act of baptism on Jesus, the one whom the Ark of Noah symbolized, like the Ark, Jesus went into and came out of the water. When he came out of the water, the Spirit of God descended upon him in the form of a dove. Why a dove? If you'll recall, Noah released a dove from the ark. That, no, that dove never returned until now. Instead of returning to the ark, the symbolic dove form of the Spirit of God returned to what the ark symbolized, Jesus Christ. Noah preached in the wilderness to the people, warning of the judgment to come and pointing to the ark, which would provide salvation from the judgment to come. John the Baptist, symbolic of Noah and even having the same name, preached in the wilderness to the people and pointing to Jesus who would provide salvation from the judgment to come. That second judgment to come is the great white throne judgment, which will not come until Jesus returns. But this all answers those who would like to suggest the flood of Noah was only a local flood. No, it was judgment upon the entire world. Jesus spoke of the great white throne judgment as similar to the flood of Noah, a judgment upon the entire world. Will the great white throne judgment be upon only a small area of the world, do you think? No, of course not. And in like fashion, Noah's flood was not some local judgment, but rather judgment upon the entire world. So if the apostles who wrote the Gospels and the stories of Jesus simply stole the Egyptian Horus mythologies upon which they built up the mythologies of Jesus, then you must contend that the apostles were super geniuses. See, there isn't one single Horus myth. There are multitudes of them, and they are all different. So in order to write the stories of Jesus based on Horus mythology, the apostles would have had to been world-renowned experts in Egyptian mythology. The internet did not exist back then for them to research all of the Horus mythologies. The apostles would also have to be experts in all of the Hebrew books in history. Not only all of that, they had to be writers whose skills and intelligence blew away the likes of Shakespeare. As they not only crafted an incredible story, but they crafted a story that carefully and meticulously copied dozens of different Horus mythologies, while simultaneously fulfilling hundreds of prophecies written by dozens of ancient Hebrew scholars who wrote as much as 1,400 years before them. They did all of this with astonishing details that the average person would never see, such as the naming of John the Baptist, the symbolic act of baptism, and the attention to detail, like the spirit descending in the form of a dove. By contending that the stories of Jesus were rewritten Horus stories, you are contending that the apostles were astonishingly brilliant and knowledgeable men. These same men then chose to willingly endure horrible, torturous deaths, rather than just simply admit that they made up the stories of Jesus. The stories of Jesus and his life are wrapped up in all of the books of the Bible, right through to Genesis, where we read the very first prophecies about the Messiah to come. We read about that right there in the Garden of Eden, in the very first chapters of the book of Genesis at the time of creation. 
So to those who suggest that Jesus was just simply a Horus sun god, all dressed up in different attire, I ask, how is that a reasonable proposition? Professor Axiom tweeted on Twitter, Watching creationists attempt to spin the Noah's Ark fairy tale as history is sad yet face-palmingly hilarious. Ironically, Professor Axiom has precisely fulfilled the prophecies that the Apostle Peter made 2,000 years ago, saying, In the last days there will come scoffers. What are they scoffing? The worldwide flood of Noah. You see, you may scoff and make fun, but I take science very seriously, which evidently you do not. The evidence for Noah's flood is, frankly, overwhelming. I would love to hear you try to explain the hundreds of features that we find all over the world that Noah's Flood produced. You know, plained mountaintops, almost a thousand kilometers long. I penned a scientific paper on one such plain nation surface in a peer-reviewed journal because I take the science seriously. I explained in that paper why there was no other explanation but a worldwide flood. And I would love to hear you attempt to explain the dozens of planation surfaces we find all over the world, just like that one. An explanation that has evaded experts like Ollier and Payne, who basically said in their textbook, mm, I don't have a solution, but I admire the problem. Well, I have a solution. A solution that you, Professor Axiom, mock, while you yourself have no explanation. I would love to hear your explanation of water gaps and wind gaps that we find by the hundreds all over the world. Canyons cut right through mountains when the water could have gone around the mountain. The Arun River now flows through one of those water gaps, which is a canyon 6,000 meters deep, four miles. My explanation is simple, a worldwide flood. The water started above the mountain. Therefore, there is no problem with my explanation. What's your explanation? And will my viewers then turn around and find your explanation laughable? Or would you even actually attempt a science, a serious scientific theory? I would love to hear your explanation of the quartzites, jaspers, and other rocks we find all over the West Coast that have been rounded and hammered by water topping plain mountain surfaces like the Cypress Hills of Alberta and Saskatchewan. The only explanation for those hammer marks is formation by water moving at least 70 miles per hour, picking up the rocks 800 kilometers away in Idaho, transporting them and hammering them together, rounding them and peppering them with hammer marks, with the rocks finally coming to a rest on top of the Plain Nation surface of Cypress Hills. Now, my model has no problem with all of this being formed at 1,500 feet above sea level. What's that? You've never been to Cypress Hills. You've never been to the east coast of Canada to study the planation surface there? Oh, you should spend less time mocking and more time in serious scientific investigation, like myself and those silly creationists have done. Now, when you're ready to have a serious discussion, I anxiously await your attempts to explain these and many, many other features from around the globe that I'm more than happy to discuss with you. In the meantime, Stephen Arsadi and myself will be showcasing these and many other pieces of profound evidence of the worldwide flood of Noah, evidence that is overwhelming, in our upcoming documentary, Mystery of Noah's Flood. Stick around, we'll be back in just one minute. The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12-DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history and examining the evidence from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are, any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources, such as question and answer and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. You can now get the entire set as an instant digital download or on DVD. Visit Ian's Bookstore today.
hell for me? Ah! Yep, that's the one. East Vietnamese jumping spider. The venom is so strong that one bite can kill any child and 95% of adults. The surviving 5% typically slip into a coma for three to six months, only to wake up with permanent paralysis. Hmm. Martin Koch wrote in on YouTube. Hi, Ian. If you know that the Bible is the instruction book for life, and you know God intended us to be vegetarian, but only sin turned us from vegetarianism, then why did you choose to follow the fallen ways of eating meat? Thanks for writing in, Martin. And while it's true that the meat eating was the result of a fallen world, which resulted from sin, the reason I eat meat is because God instructed us to. You see, something happened at the time of the flood that prompted God to tell us to now eat meat to sustain ourselves. As we read in Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. See, something happened at the time of the flood, a flood which was judgment against the sin of mankind. And we find in the fossil record plants like the club moss, which a plant that grows today may be 16 inches tall. Yet in the fossil record, we find the same plant up to 120 feet tall. Something happened to the environment, and something happened to the plants as a result, our original food source. What plants did we lose during that radical environmental change? Did we lose really high protein plants, and as a result, we now need to supplement our diet with animal protein? It would appear so. On that note, Preston also sent me a short video clip on Facebook from William Lane Craig talking about animal death before Adam's sin. Hey Ian, what do you think of this and WLC in general? Well, thanks for writing in Preston. In this video, Dr. Craig responds to the question of how does he reconcile a good God with the fossil record, which is full of death, disease, cancer, suffering, etc. Now, you need to understand, Dr. Craig is an outstanding apologist, but one who has actually referred to young earth creation beliefs and creationary thinkers like myself as embarrassing to the Christian faith. Now, Dr. Craig believes in an old earth and evolution. Now, I actually quite like Dr. Craig, but it's comments like what he made in that video that blow me away how such an excellent scholar could be so blatantly wrong in his comments and you'll sadly notice that his horrible theology stems from his stance on creation and evolution. Now, I'm certain he did not intend to, but he definitely cherry-picked his Bible verses. Craig defended his belief in deep time and contended that animal death, disease, and predation was not the result of Adam's sin and continually, continually refers to those people like myself reading things into the text that aren't there. For example, I find it terribly ironic that here's a case where people who think of themselves as very literal Bible-believing Christians are actually reading things in between the lines of Scripture that are not there. So in any kind of a viable ecosystem like the Earth, there's going to have to be animal predation in order for the ecosystem to survive, even if it's just insect eating one another or birds eating insects. The Scripture says in Psalms that the young lions cry out for their prey and God gives them their prey. This is part of God's created order. For a Bible scholar the likes of Dr. Craig to say such a thing surprises me to say the least. As it says very clearly in Genesis chapter 1, 29 through 31, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he made. Behold, it was very good. Notice that it was this plan that God called very good. Question. 
when that verse says every beast, do you think it includes the lion? When it says every fowl of the air, do you think it includes the eagle? The hawk? But this was the original creation, before the sin of Adam and Eve. The verse Dr. Craig quoted in Psalms about God giving the lion its prey was after the flood, which, as we just discussed, something radical changed in the environment and with plants at that time. In fact, notice what God says about the animals when pronouncing the judgment of the flood on the earth. He includes the animals when he says he repents for creating them. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And in verses 11 through 13, we read why. The earth was filled with violence. All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, has Dr. Craig forgotten that throughout the scriptures, death is referred to as an enemy. Evolution uses death and disease to create. Therefore, evolution is an enemy, according to God. Death is the last enemy enemy to be defeated, not some part of God's created order. Now, I don't know how it could be more plain. This is not reading into the scriptures. I must respectfully disagree with Dr. Craig on these matters. Furthermore, the whole point of deep time and the idea of an old earth was to explain away the profound worldwide evidence for Noah's flood. That evidence is the rock layers containing dead and diseased creatures which were killed by the greatest physical catastrophe this world has ever seen, the flood of Noah. So Dr. Craig is also unaware of both the history and science behind the interpretation of the fossil record and has attempted to fit the secular interpretation into the scriptures. A secular interpretation being forced into a book for which it was specifically invented to refute. So, of course, Dr. Craig is going to have a great many theological issues. Nevertheless, I have tremendous respect for Dr. Craig, even if I must disagree with him on multiple points. Brendan wrote in on Facebook. Do you consider deep underwater creatures such as the anglerfish and Pacific viperfish to be virtually unchanged since the time of creation, since they would have been too far underwater to have been affected by the flood? Actually, I would say they were affected by the flood. For example, there was a study conducted a couple of years ago which showed that whales get the bends from deep sea diving. Now, for those not familiar with it, the bends is a term for deep water divers who get air bubbles in their blood from diving too deep, too long, and then surfacing too quickly. Gases under pressure with liquids will dissolve in the liquid. A classic example is soda pop, which has dissolved carbon dioxide, a gas, in the liquid. Now, as long as the liquid is under pressure, the gas remains dissolved. But the moment you remove the pressure, the gas comes out of the liquid as bubbles. Now, when you dive to even a mere 8 or 10 feet underwater, you can feel the pressure on your ears. So when you go down to over 100 feet, the pressure is enormous and breathing high-pressure gas down there for a long time causes a lot of nitrogen to be absorbed into your blood. Now, if you come up too quickly, then, just like removing the cap off of a pop bottle, you remove the pressure from off of your body, and nitrogen comes out of your blood in the form of bubbles. Now, this isn't just painful, it can be fatal. By ascending from deep water slowly, the nitrogen gets a chance to escape from your blood through your lungs and thus not form as bubbles in your blood. The research paper from a few years back discovered that whales were getting the bends from extreme deep water diving. From this and my creationary viewpoint, I would conclude that the whales were actually not designed to dive so deep. In fact, the oceans contain the waters from a worldwide flood, which apparently came from underground at the time of the flood. So our oceans are perhaps considerably deeper now than at the time of creation. 
As a result of deeper, darker waters, and things like caves, we get various fish who lose their eyesight, for example, because they're just not using their eyes anymore, as they live in an environment they weren't designed to live in. So why were these fish, like the angler fish, designed the way they were? I haven't got a clue. <laughs> we're judging their design from the present fallen world. In experiments conducted at Texas A&M, where they quite possibly simulated some of the conditions of the world before the flood, they found that the rainbow trout, a very aggressive carnivorous fish, would feast on the droppings of birds and be sustained just fine and grew quite large. So by just a couple of environmental changes, we see a radical departure from their lifestyle, which we know of now in this present fallen world and see what was perhaps a codependent system which was non-violent in the pre-flood world. The fish lived off the waste of the birds. I hope that helps. Okay, we gotta call that a wrap. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now. Thank you for watching Genesis Week, and we hope to see you again next week. Remember, you can send in your comments, questions, as well as passwords and numbers for all of your offshore bank accounts to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com, or you can send us a tweet at Genesis Week. Or you can go to GenesisWeek.com, which is our YouTube channel. Find the most recent show and post a comment there. Or you can leave a comment on our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash GenesisWeekTV. Remember those words of warning and hope from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org donations, and thank you for your support.